Welcome to the Burden and Blessing Podcast, a study and discussion forum on the truth of God's Word. Our review series examines books, movies, music, and other media in the light of God's truth. We pray that it will be eye-opening, instructional, and beneficial for your daily walk with Christ. Welcome back to Burden and Blessing today. As we come to the end of a portion of the church year and begin to enter another. We're going to take up a study once again of one of the hymns of the hymnal that fits into this time of the church year. This coming Sunday we will be considering the doctrine of the Trinity and the festival of Holy Trinity and so we're going to be considering one of those great Trinitarian hymns in our hymnal. Uh, one that is very well known in a lot of different ways. The author is well known as well as the doctrine that is brought out there. Joining me to go through this Trinitarian hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, hymn 246 in the Lutheran hymnal is Pastor Rob Sowers. Rob, glad to have you with us again. Yeah, great to be with you. I'm always excited to uh, do a study on a hymn. Well, we have not done a Trinity one in quite a while. It comes around once a year. Uh, yeah. As far as the, the, the season goes, we're always celebrating the Trinity, which we'll talk a little bit about more later. But this hymn has an interesting background. The, the author for this hymn is sort of well known, at least in the Lutheran hymnal. He has written a number of other hymns that are sung regularly. Let's talk a little bit about just who is Reginald Heber. What, where did he come from and why is he uh, well known? Yeah, so Reginald Heber, he uh, he was an Anglican priest, and uh, just kind of a word about him being an Anglican, you know, when our Lutheran hymnal was put together, you know, we have, of course, a lot of the old German hymns that have been translated and such, um, but we also picked some of the good already English written hymns when um, when the primary language really in Lutheranism went from the German as it was in you know the 1800s, early 1900s, to having you know more of an English hymnal and things like that. So they picked up on um, some of these good hymn writers, even from other de denominations, and Heber is one of those. So he's an Anglican priest, of course, writing in English. Then he was born in England in 1783, um, and. He had sort of an interesting life. At 40, he became the Bishop of Calcutta in India, which, which at that time meant that he was basically the Bishop of the entire country of India. Um, he served there only three years, and then through all of the work and, and dealing with the weather there and the travel sort of took its toll on his health, and so he dies of a stroke at just the age of 43. But he writes 57 hymns total, and we have five of them in the Lutheran hymnal, and these are hymns that that are pretty well known to us. So this one, of course, uh, we also have uh, the mission hymn from Greenland's Icy Mountains, which is one that, that people know very well, an Advent hymn, Hosanna to the Living Lord. Uh, and then an Epiphany hymn, hymn 128, brightest and best of the sons of the morning. And then hymn 452, the Son of God goes forth to war. So uh, hymns that certainly are, are ones that I think every one of us listening uh, with a Lutheran background has sung. And really, Heber was one of the first ones to sort of follow that Lutheran tradition of having hymns for each of the Sundays of the church year. And so that's why you see a wide variety of hymns with Heber. So um, might not have recognized his name right away, but certainly you'll recognize singing his hymns. Interestingly, uh, you, you mentioned his his stay in India at the end of his life, and he died as a, as a fairly young man as a result of those health complications of his work in India. But he had yeah. always desired to go to India. And interestingly, even that great, India missionary hymn, you know, that, that hymn that you talk, talked about from Greenland's Icy Mountains, what has right. the picture language of India, was actually written while he was still in England before he ever yeah. made it to India, which shows his desire for missions even in those early years. So very familiar, at least like you said, m many people might not know his name, 
but you will certainly be familiar with the hymns that he wrote. And as an English writer, the other thing that comes out with this hymn, as you pointed out, is that you don't have a translator. We're dealing with, for the most part, the actual words that were written by the author to begin with without having to go through a translation process, which many times muddies the water of the original. And you can debate then whether that's a good translation of the original or not. But we're not dealing with that here with this particular hymn. Yeah, you know, the English would be familiar enough. Um, you've got, of course, the, uh, the you know, a little bit of the Elizabethan English. But, um, you know, there's nothing that's difficult, I don't think, to understand with the language itself in this hymn. This Sunday is really a striking transitional Sunday in the church year, moving from what we call the festival half to the non-festival half. But it's it's a pivoting point. They both, yes. the festival half and the non-festival half, they both deal with the Trinity. It's just more specific in the first half, dealing with Father, Son, Holy Spirit, moving on now to the result in the Christian life and what they continue to do in our lives during the non-festival half. So a very, right. very important Sunday in the church here, and without getting into the debate of whether we call it Sundays after Pentecost or uh, Pentecost season or Trinity season, I mm -hmm. favor, like you, the Sundays of Trinity, because that really is the focal point as opposed to Pentecost being the focal point. It's the, the Trinity who is at work. Right. So this particular hymn, written in English, based on a lot of uh, specific passages, both in the Old and the New Testament, is going to really develop the work and the, the nature of the Trinity, describing what that is for us as Christians. So there are four verses in, in this particular hymn. Let's jump into the first of those four verses. Uh, Heber writes, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Your thoughts on that first verse? Right. So you mentioned that uh, there's plenty of scripture, of course, that's packed into this. Uh, two, two passages in particular sort of jump off the page in this first stanza, um, that scene in Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah um, is standing before God, and you've got the seraphim calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And that is repeated in Revelation 4.8, where you've got now the four living creatures. Um, and, you know, they're described in a lot of the same ways. Maybe they are the seraphim or cherubim. It's hard to tell exactly what uh, how we would identify who these creatures are, but their song is the same song as we would imagine. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come, which we'll, we'll get to the second part of that in uh, our second stanza. First of all, um, early in the morning, our song shall rise to thee. Obviously, we sing our praises to him, whether it be in the morning or the evening. Uh, but, you know, certainly written as as a morning hymn. Um, when I have used this, I've usually used this as the very first hymn of, of that Sunday, um, kind of because of that line. What I really want to specifically focus on, I think, in this first stanza has to do with the third line. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty. In, in Lutheranism, I think we do so much better of a job than, than so many others at talking about both aspects. We, of course, don't deny God's power at all. He is mighty. He is almighty. And, and, and we confess that. But probably more our focus is on the fact that although he is almighty, he is also a merciful God. And that is how he has chosen to reveal himself to us also as a gracious and merciful God. And he, of course, demonstrates that with the entire plan of salvation, sending his son for no reason other than his great love for us. And so um, I love that, that Heber puts both of those points together there because it's so important that our triune God is described as being both of those things. The last line then, gives you sort of, uh, you might call this maybe the Twitter version of the creed, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. 
you know, we'll confess, as I mentioned before, the Athanasian Creed, most of us, um, and that gets pretty lengthy. But uh, if you're going to do it in one line, that's pretty good. It's interesting. You know, you talked about our focus as Lutherans, and this hymn is not as specific. It doesn't get into the, the details like many of the other Trinitarian hymns in our hymnal. Right. But like you said, it does just give you that broad overview of what the doctrine of the Trinity is in a very concise way. And it's probably, like you said, summed up in that last line, which is going to be repeated uh, later on in one of the other verses as well. Yes. Let's dig into verse 2. It starts the same way. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, which wert and art and evermore shall be. Now, of all of the verses, this is probably the one that is, at least for those that are unfamiliar with Scripture, the most difficult to understand because there are some big terms in here. And yeah. there are some, some expressions or pictures that are probably not super familiar either. Go into that for us. Sure. Uh, so, you know, our hymnal mentions Revelation 4, verse 8. But if you go on to verses 9 through 11, and I'll just kind of read those, um, it's, it's this picture that John is seeing of heaven, and it says, And whenever the living creatures give glory and, and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, of course, referring to our triune God, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And then here's this line that we have in our hymn. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Um, so we see all of the saints there bowing before him, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. We get that picture in Revelation 4, 6. Uh, before the throne, uh, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And so you think, all right, well, yeah, nice picture of of peace and calm and quiet and that's you know kind of a really nice picture that we might get but it's so much deeper of a meaning than that when you understand the role that the sea takes particularly in the old testament the sea is a picture of chaos it's a picture of rebellion against god it's a picture of everything that's terrible um and so you know, the sea, of course, we think of sea travel, and we see some examples in in uh, the scriptures of the difficulty of sea travel. You remember Paul and one of his missionary journeys was shipwrecked. Um, people did not like to travel by the sea because the sea was unpredictable. Storms could come up. That's the picture of uh, in, in the Old Testament. So that's why in Psalm 23, it's so significant that our Lord leads us beside the still waters. Because, again, water, sea, is a picture of, of, of evil. So the fact that heaven is this sea of glass like crystal, it's this peaceful place, uh, it emphasizes, if we go back to stanza one, um, again, our merciful God, and what this place, heaven, is going to be like for us. Um, it's this place of, of total peace and calm. It's, and, and it's that peace that comes from, from God wiping out that rebellion that existed between us and him through his son. So such a beautiful picture there when you think of the Old Testament impl implications of the sea. Um, cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee. The, uh, this is maybe the one place in this hymn 
where there's a little bit of, what would you say, artistic license that's taken. Um, certainly there are cherubim and seraphim. They're a little bit difficult to identify. Seraphim are only mentioned specifically in Isaiah chapter 6, though we have a creature in Revelation that's very similar to that, maybe the same thing. Cherubim are mentioned, I believe, only, well, no, it's, it's more than the book of Revelation. Uh, Ezekiel mentions the cherubim as well, um, and they're a little bit different from the seraphim. The only thing where we get sort of this artistic license here maybe is we don't have any reference to them sort of falling down before our Lord. Though, in a sense, you know, everything in heaven is falling down and worshiping the Lord. So um wouldn't say it's wrong. You just don't have a specific reference to that. Um, this last part then, this this last line really gets into something that is really impossible to describe about our Trinity, um, which wert and art and evermore shall be, um, in a little bit more modern English, uh, who is and was and evermore shall be. Uh, how do we describe God who is outside of time, but also present in time, who sees all time all at once? How do you picture that? I mean, I don't know. Uh, it's and maybe something like that is concerning to some. You know, we like to we like to picture everything in terms that we can understand. Um, I always take comfort in the fact, though, that our God is 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 not able to be understood. If we can if we can understand God, who's greater? Probably us. Um, but we would expect that that our God would be beyond description at some point, and, and, and there's a lot of comfort to be taken in that, because that shows me, anyway, that he really is almighty, that he's all-powerful, that one who could be outside of time and in time and present all at once, and who can hear my prayers individually and, and work all things together for my good, and also work things together for your good individually and for everyone listening individually. Uh, it, it's just... It's beyond description, and I think that's really what's highlighted by uh, that last stanza. So wonderful, um, a wonderful stanza that's packed with just so much information. So the the first verse brings out the qualities of God: merciful, mighty, which we talked about. The yep. second verse brings out the eternal nature. That last verse, in particular, the eternal yes. nature of the Trinity. The third verse brings out another quality which is also important, and that is his holiness. Verse 3, holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see, only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love, in purity. Yeah, you mentioned holiness, and I wonder how much of a picture we have of what holiness is in our world today. Um, you know, it's one of those words like awesome. You know how we overuse the word awesome. Um, you know, I think when you use it as like, you know, you see something that is maybe even a little bit less than amazing, and your and your reply is "Holy cow" or something like that. Well, what do we even mean when we say something like that? Um, you know, why the cow? I suppose that has something to do with Hinduism. But I mean, think of holy though. What does that word really mean? And do we really have a concept of what holiness is? Um, you know, we learn in the Catechism that that uh, holiness has to do with with being set apart. And that is what our God is. And I think the way that the stanza describes God's holiness, uh, that, that refrain that we've been singing now in the first three stanzas, and we'll sing also in the fourth, holy, 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 what does that really mean? You get that description in the second half of the first line, though the darkness hide thee. And we might have sort of pause there because we don't usually think of God as being darkness. We think of God, God as light, and in him is no darkness at all, right? Um, but 
God also does reveal himself when he's revealing that that holiness that he is so set apart from us uh, that it's it's impossible to describe. Um, you get that picture of darkness. Think of the giving of the Ten Commandments uh, in Exodus 20. So God gives Moses the Ten Commandments, and then you read after that in verses 18 through 21, now when all pe the people saw the, th the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be done before you, that you may not sin. And then here it comes. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. So you have that picture of, of this, this darkness um, and, and the terror of what it's like for us sinners to stand before a holy God, it's beyond our, our description. And imagine how much we would tremble. And Moses, even though he enters into that darkness in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, we read that Moses also was trembling as he approached the mighty God. Um, and so it's really true what we have in that second line then, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. We are so unexplainably not holy compared to God that we can't look into his glory. Remember Moses in Exodus 33, he wants to see God's glory. And the Lord says, you can't see my glory and live. And then he does, though, place him in that rock and his glory passes by, and he allows Moses to see his backside as he goes by, uh, but he doesn't let him see his face. And yet, that's still enough, just seeing the backside of God going away uh, to where Moses' face is changed and all that stuff. Uh, so just just such an emphasis on, on the holiness of of God, and then what follows is that third stanza. Only thou art holy, there is none beside thee. This comes from Revelation also, Revelation 15, verse 4. Um, it, it's, uh, it's the people saying, For you alone are holy, all nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Uh, so just that emphasis that God and God alone is holy, uh, he alone, then, is the one who is perfect in power, but also in love and purity, which is emphasized, of course, in God sending his son. And, you know, I love the description. I mentioned Hebrews 12 already. Um, you get this this distinction that's that's drawn by the writer of the Hebrews of that scene that, that I just described in Exodus chapter 20. And then the contrast, uh, you know, so that's that's Mount Sinai. The contrast then, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable angels in festal gathering. It's, it's this amazing, amazing picture. And why? Because Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant uh, who sprinkles that blood that speaks a better word than the blood of, of Abel. It's... So in connection with that holiness, that perfect power, we still see our God's love and his purity in sending his son to, to pay for our sins and bringing us to Mount Zion so that we can be in the presence of God without fear, uh, without trembling, because our, our Savior really, in God's sight, makes us holy so that we can approach our God. So in the first three stanzas, we've considered the mercy of God, the power of God. We've considered the eternal nature of God, now the holiness of God. The fourth verse is almost completely a repeat of the first verse, but with one difference. Yes. And it's this verse, this line in this last verse that really shows now that we've considered who the Trinity is, what is our response? Verse 4, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, 
All thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Yes. So this is what we're looking forward to. And that, and that unique stanza is stanza two. All thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. And if we were to just look at the world around us right now, we would say that's impossible. Um, we look at the world and we see things that, that, that now, um, I don't know that, that, that anyone could possibly imagine that our, our society, our world would go so far from God. And so the thought of all the works praising his name in earth and sky and sea doesn't seem possible. And yet that's the promise that our God gives us. Um, and so it's really, that's what we look forward to. And our God who has kept every other promise will also keep that promise that he makes in Philippians chapter 2, that, that every knee shall bow at, at the name of Jesus. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. And isn't that the picture that we have in Revelation 2, uh, that, that picture of the new heavens and the new earth, where, where really it will happen that, that everything will praise the Lord in earth and sky and sea. That's, that's our confidence going forward. Um, I think of it, you know, with, with the picture of a funeral. You know, the funeral, um, especially for unbelievers, can be one of the saddest things that you'll ever experience. And yet for us, even through those tears, there's a joy because we know that person will rise. That person is going to be restored in the new heavens and the new earth. And so this is such a looking forward. Again, it's, it's an emphasis of, of everything that we've looked at before. God's holiness, his, his almighty power, his, his, his mercy, um, his love for us. It's all there. Um, and we look forward to that day when, when everyone will we'll recognize our Lord for who he is, the merciful, the mighty one. Um, and I don't know, maybe we'll have a, even a, full under, a fuller understanding of the Trinity as well. Um, but uh, it's, again, an indescribable joy that, that we'll have um, that we get little snippets of in, in our world. Um, you know, you think of the sacraments, for example, um, coming into the presence of God in that way. And, you know, anytime we hear God's word, we gather for worship, we get little tastes of that. Um, and that all looks forward to that time when, when we'll experience where um, creation is restored. Everything gives praise and honor and glory that is due to our holy God. One of the most amazing things to me about not just this hymn, but many of the hymns in our hymnal, and you brought it out so well in our discussion today, is how packed full this hymn is of allusions or, or direct quotations from Scripture. When, yeah. I was, when I was young, Rob, I had the practice of taking my hymnal and writing in the scriptural reference next to each line in the hymns that they referred to or were drawn from. And if you were to do this with this particular hymn, you would have a scriptural reference next to every phrase or line throughout this entire hymn, just showing how well the hymn writer pulls all of these passages together in order to describe the nature of our God. What sets this God, the true God, apart from every other God in the world? And, and so that is one of the reasons why it is one of those great treasures, even in our Lutheran hymnody, even though it comes from Anglicanism, yep. uh, that it describes this, the nature of the one true God. There is none beside him. And thanks be to God that there is none, that he is the only one who is merciful and mighty, who is infinite in power, who is eternal in nature, who is gracious in his son and yet pure, and has given all of that to us through Christ. We'll close out today by listening to the Lutheran Quartet as they sing these four verses of Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. 
Rob, thanks for taking us through this study this morning. Come back and join us again in the future, listeners, as we continue to consider these wonderful hymns that are ours in Lutheranism and which we continue to proclaim today. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. you to join us every week for another episode of Burden and Blessing Podcast, where we will continue to proclaim Jesus Christ as the one and only Savior for sinners. Until next week, take comfort in the fact that God is your rock and ever-present help in trouble.